Welcome to our podcast, Sprinkle with Hope. We have an amazing, incredible guest with us tonight, Amberly Lago. She is a speaker, an author, uh, just all around a great person. So Amberly, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with y'all. And we didn't intend to color code, but we all wore Dodger blue tonight, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? <laughs> I got the memo, yes. <laughs> yeah, she did get the memo. <laughs> So Amberly, for those of um, our listeners who don't, who might not know you, why don't you just give a little history or um, a little bit of your story, your background, and it's amazing. So. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I know I probably don't sound like I'm from California. I'm originally from Texas. I grew up in a small town and had big dreams of moving to California and Everybody was like, oh, you'll never make it there. Good luck. You know, don't don't pack everything. You're going to be right back home. Don't take everything with you. And um, I come from a big family where if we wanted to do something, we had to work for it. So I started working at age 13. I was um, I worked at a little place called the cookie jar where I roller skated around, baked cookies and sold cookies. I taught dance. I was a lifeguard. I babysat. I scrub toilets. I basically did whatever I could to save up enough money to move to California. And I think I wanted to move to California so bad because every year we got to go to Dallas and go to this convention where they had these teachers from LA and they were just like rock stars to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, then MTV came out and you saw the backup dancers and the music videos. And I was like, wow, you can get paid to dance. That is what I'm doing. So um, I packed up my little Suzuki Samurai and traveled out to LA and ignorance is bliss. I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, I was from a small town. I remember the first time I stopped in San Francisco first. And I remember I, I had an appointment to go meet with a photographer. And I remember walking down Central Avenue and I was in a dress and I had people whistling at me and I remember going, what are they whistling at? What's going like, what is going yeah. on here? I had never in my life been whistled at or had attention like that. And, and then, you know, when I got to LA, I got mugged and that was oh, definitely geez. not something that happens in a small town. No. And so it was like, <laughs> welcome to the big city, you know? Um, <laughs> But I, I got on scholarship, which was my dream. And um, that was at a small dance studio um, and got an agent, started dancing. And really, I remember one of my first dance jobs, I got to go to Japan. And I remember getting that job and running out and using the payphone to call, that was when there were still payphones, and calling my mom and saying, Mom, I get to go to Japan and dance. And so I was really, you know, living the life of my dreams, dancing and traveling. Um, and then I got into fitness and I had a family and you know, I was doing fitness videos and infomercials for Body by Jake and sponsored by Nike and, you know, nationally recognized as um, a fitness trainer. And everything changed in the blink of an eye. When I was coming home from work that day, I had ran my best time. I'd ran 11 miles in my best time. And to me, running was fun. That was my therapy. Right. That was something I loved to do. I mean, I ran track in high school and and coming home from work that day, I was on my Harley and I got hit by an SUV and I couldn't really do anything but try to jump off my bike and let go of the clutch and thrown 30 feet. And I remember I was sliding across the asphalt mm -hmm. and all I could think of is please just don't let another car hit me because I was a, a busy road and I couldn't tell what I was sliding into. When I finally came to a stop, I looked down at my leg and I only looked once because it was just crumbled into mm. pieces. Mm. And I realized now looking back that here I was looking at my leg, my femoral artery severed, there's, there's blood everywhere. And I realized looking back that one of my defaults has always been to, okay, well, what can I do? What am I going to do about this? You know, and one of my first thoughts was, oh, I may have to train 
clients on crutches for a while. That kind of sucks. And I was like, I had no idea that it would just, it would, this was changing the course of my life forever. Um, I was rushed to the hospital and in, in the ER, it was just crazy because my husband is a Lieutenant commander with a CHP and in the brotherhood of the, and sisterhood of the police force news travels fast. So there were the whole room, the ER was like filled with cops and it was chaotic and I'm strapped to this, you know, this board and I can't see anything. And I hear this wailing like someone crying and I'm like what is that this is crazy and I look and I had never seen my husband cry I mean he's a big tough mm -hmm. guy he's a first responder and there he was hysterical not just crying hysterical and mm -hmm. running back and forth and I yelled across the ER Johnny get over here I need you to be strong for me and at that moment I really needed to know I, I needed him to be there for our two daughters. I didn't know if I was going to wake up. I, did, I thought I was dying. They, then I had this nurse. Um, I later found out, I went to the hospital. I found out her name is Shaniqua, but she was this beautiful nurse with flowing hair. And she leaned over me and she said, we're going to give you something to make you feel all better now. And that's the last thing that I remember before I woke up from a coma. I had no idea how long I'd been out. And when you're in a coma for that long, you know, they put Vaseline on your eyes so your eyes don't dry out. And I had tubes down my throat. And when I woke up, I was just, I'm trying to rip the tubes out. And they're like, oh, no, 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 honey, don't rip the, don't rip those out. And they're like, I think she's trying to talk. And, you know, my husband's leaning over me and he's got tears in his eyes. And I, I, they give me a notepad. And the first thing I write is, get off my tubes and he was leaning on my tubes and I couldn't breathe oh, and so no. I was like not like I love you honey how long have I been out but it was it was a, a crazy you know situation like there was so much emotion like I'm alive how long have I been out um and then next came the news of we're going to amputate your leg and you know the doctor said this is like a war wound. Your leg is crushed. You've got a 1% chance of saving your leg. And I was like, okay, well, there's, so there's a chance there's yeah. that there's a 1% chance. Well, we need to find a doctor that's going to save it. And right. I swear that took an act of God, but we found a doctor, Dr. Wiss, and we got, you know, transferred. My, my husband is actually the one who, put the cease and desist on the other surgeon who was just going to amputate it. He was like, no, I want her to wake up with both of her legs. I want this to be her decision. And so, you know, he's still kids around, you know, you've got both your legs because of me, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's been quite the journey. And, you know, I hung on to that 1% chance and that got me through 34 surgeries and months in the hospital. And, you know, a lot of grit and by the grace of God that I'm so grateful that my journey has led me here with you and um, all the listeners. And I really, my intention is to share some things that will help, you know, whoever's listening right now, who's going through a hard time, you know, to that's my main intention is just to share some tips and some hope to get you through what you're going through right now. Because I think that when we share our experience and we see others and we got, you know what, if she got through that, I know I can get through it too. And, and you know what we were just talking about before we started recording, you're like, you know, you've, you've done so much and thanks for being here. And, you know, you've come so far. And I was like, I don't feel like I've come very far right now. I'm sitting with one shoe off and, one shoe on because my foot hurts so bad. And, and, you know, we all have those days, but the thing is, but I was like, but I'm here, I'm, I'm yep. here with you. And that's what I'm grateful for. I think gratitude takes you far. I, I totally agree. hundred percent. I mean, gratitude does take you far. And I think when you are grateful for the things that you have, you know, that actually helps kind of lift you up, kind of buoy you up, you know, and, and, uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing your story because, you know, I mean, I think sometimes we we try to think that, oh, everything's going to be good and you're in this bad place. But, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of still held on to that 
one percent chance that that everything is going to be okay and you know you're going to get through that so how do you deal with or how did you deal with this particular difficulty and how does that how did how did you move through that um well you know it I didn't realize at the time, you know, sometimes we go through hard situations and we are like, you know, why am I going through this? How am I going to get through it? And I think that growing up um, in Texas and they don't mess around the coaches there. I mean, it's, it's like go big or go home and run and track. And, you know, the coach didn't care if I was hurting had a sprained ankle, you know, was throwing up. She's just like, get off the track to throw up. And so a lot of these things in dance too, you know, my dance teacher was like, your choice, the show must go on. Are you going to be able to dance? Are you going to be able to do it? Because we will find somebody to replace you if you are not going to be able to do this. And so I learned grit, you know, growing Mm -hmm. up with amazing coaches and, you know, dance teachers. And I remember there were days where, you know, I would cry as a kid. I was like, why is she so hard on me? Like why she, she seems to single me out now as an adult. And I see my, my daughter, one that she's got a coach and he can single her out. And I said, well, Ruby, that's my daughter. I said, Ruby, it's because you have so much potential that he Mm -hmm. sees in you. I said, he wouldn't care. He wouldn't push you if he didn't think you had potential. So I think that growing up and, you know, we, that grit is really your, your passion and your perseverance and that will get you far. And that got me really far, just being able to cowgirl up and pull up my bootstraps. And, but it's, it's not easy. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you just pull up your bootstraps and do it. It was hell. I mean, when I was in the hospital, that was Mm -hmm. one thing getting through surgeries. But the real journey began when I got home from the hospital, because that's when it was like, okay, uh, you don't have a nurse to come in and help you when, you know, I was bedridden still for months. And so I had a bedpan. And so I'd have to, you know, sometimes call my husband down in the middle of the night to carry my bedpan. Those experiences were humbling. And I think, you know, people, I actually had somebody say, well, how'd you learn to walk again? And I said, well, it was literally seconds at a time. It wasn't one Mm. step at a time. It was seconds at a time because I couldn't stand up for so long. And I remember the first time I had a physical therapist come over to the house and she goes, okay, we're going to start physical therapy today. I need you to just lift up your leg. Now my leg had been held together with a bunch of steel rods just to keep it from falling off of my body for so long. And there was a disconnect between my mind and my leg. I think it was some sort of like protective mechanism, like do not move that leg. It just might fall off. And so when I healed enough to be able that I should have been able to move it, the, the physical therapist said, okay, well go ahead and lift your leg off of the bed. And I was like, okay. And it wouldn't work. Mm. Next day came over, go ahead and lift your leg up off the bed. It wouldn't work. And I thought, oh my God, am I going to be paralyzed? Am I just not going to be able to move this leg at all? And so fear set in, anxiety set in, frustration set in. And then I remembered, no, I've got grit. I, I remembered my passion, my passion And my purpose, my reason, I had a reason to get up. I wanted to get up so bad. I wanted to be able to chase after my kids. My daughter was only two years old. I wanted so badly to be able to train clients again. Not just that I wanted to walk again. I had a purpose. I wanted to be of service to others. And the only way I was going to be able to do that in my mind was to be able to stand up. And so The next time she came over, I thought hard and I I, I thought I am going to move my leg. And with all my might, I was able to move my leg. And so it literally took weeks to be able to stand up for seconds at a time. And and that's, I, I share those moments because, you know, a lot of times, especially with social media now, it just looks so easy. Like somebody is all of a sudden the best selling author and you don't see the, the months or years even of the behind the scenes, like how long it took to write that book and the 
the pub, the nightmare of the publishing process that they went through and the stress and the self doubt and, and all those things, sometimes you don't see those things. And, you know, when I was struggling, just trying to stand up again, I wasn't even on social media. I was just trying to heal. I was just trying to heal right. my mind, my body, my spirit, my spirit. And I think that's what it takes to get through a hard situation. It's just not your mindset. It was my body. I had to be as strong as I could. So even when I was stuck in the hospital bed, I knew that if I could work out that I would feel better when we move our body, it moves your mind. And I knew that. And because I knew what it did for me when I struggled as a kid, when I was being sexually abused as a kid, I knew what it did for me to work out and to dance and to run. It made me feel good. So I knew if I could just move my body, I would feel better. And so I had one of the trainers um, that I worked with brought me some dumbbells and I started doing some curls. I had a pull-up bar installed over my hospital bed. I was doing pull-ups. I was doing everything I could to stay strong because when we feel, feel like, okay, well, I'm able to do this. It gives us, and not only, I don't think gave me a sense of like, I'm getting stronger. It mentally made me feel stronger. It made me feel like I was getting better. Even if they were small steps, I still celebrated those small victories along the way. Um, another thing that really helped me was to get out of my pity party. Like mm -hmm. I was, I remember the moment I was in the hospital bed and I was watching some infomercial and it was how to get a Brazilian butt. And I remember looking at that infomercial and going, oh my God, it hit me. I'll never have a Brazilian butt. I'm <laughs> like, I swear. I was like, how shallow that sounds. But I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm scarred up from the leg down. Will I ever wear a bikini again? Like I, right. I started spiraling down into this pity party of there goes my fitness career. Will my husband ever love me again? Will I mm. ever be able to chase my daughter? Like what ifs and the, I'm not good enough. And it all sank in. And mm. I thought I have, I have a decision to make here. I can keep going down this road of despair and just sink into this pity party and, or I can do something about this. And I chose to do something different. And I think that is when we are going into those places and when you're feeling yourself fall into that self-doubt or that comparison where you're comparing yourself to somebody and you're thinking they're so much better or whatever it may be, if we can stop ourselves in that moment. And for me, it's a way to shift your perspective and how I do that. One of the quickest ways to do that is to, like we talked about a little bit ago of just getting grateful. And I didn't realize just how much that works until I was in the moment. And mm -hmm. instead of looking down at my leg and, and, and thinking all these thoughts of, you know, I'm all scarred up. I don't know if I'll ever walk again. Is today going to be the day they amputate it? I started writing in my journal, everything I was grateful for. Like, and, and a lot of it was, I started writing in my journal reminders of thank you notes that I needed to send out because I was drugged up. And I was like, I don't want to forget to, you know, send a thank you note to Nancy. My mom will be upset with me if I don't do that, you know? And I noticed when I started, the more I thought about, wow, I'm so thankful that she brought me flowers and oh my goodness, I can't believe that nurse came in and sat with me and talked to me. And I wrote down every nurse that came in and took care of me. And I started thinking about all the blessings that I had in life. Like, then I thought I get to see my daughter tomorrow. I hadn't seen my daughter in two weeks because I'd been in ICU. And I started focusing on these small goals. If I could just sit up in my wheelchair, then they could roll me out to see her in ICU. And so all these little things. So by being grateful, by focusing on good things to come in the future. And also, you know, sometimes we have to think about how worse it could be. Like I was like, well, it could be worse. I could be dead. <laughs> Right. Could be worse. I could, you know, be, you know, really struggling with an infection right now, whatever that may be. But 
those, that's something I do on an everyday basis. And I think the more that you get grounded into gratitude and you make that a practice, it becomes a part of your life. And so when something comes along and, and tries to derail you, or you feel like the rug's been pulled out from underneath you, you can get back on track sooner. You can get, you know, you can shift your perspective quicker. And so my gratitude practice is every morning I write down um, in a journal and I write down my intentions. And then I also write down, I'll, let me see what I wrote this morning. Let me share that with you. I write down, I have an accountability partner. I have um, one of my best friends. Let me see what I wrote to her that I was grateful for today. So every morning I write to my girlfriend, we take a picture of something that we've read that's either inspirational or it's in a self-development book. And this morning... I wrote, um, I'm so grateful for you. What a beautiful reading. She had sent me her reading. I'm so, I'm grateful for this cool morning and that I could ride my stationary bike in the garage. Grateful for sweet Ruby and that I have, that I overheard her talking to her teacher about me and that we have such a good relationship. Grateful for my sobriety and to wake up, uh, wake up hangover free love you so much. I'll send you my reading now. And so I text her something that I'm feeling in the moment. And so I don't think that it's, you know, you can write down, oh, I'm grateful I have a roof over my head. I'm grateful I have a husband. But if you write it down and you express that gratitude and you really feel it, it changes your day. And I, you know, I feel like so often, you know, I want to wake mm -hmm. up and I want to check my Instagram or I want to, right. you know, <laughs> check the news or whatever it is. And if I, I don't let myself do that as much as I want to, I set that time in the morning aside to really get grounded in prayer in gratitude in a short meditation and I move my body and I take care of myself. And so that way, the rest of the day, I know that I'm going to get through my chronic pain a little easier. I know right. that my mindset's going to be better and it might seem like a lot to do in the morning, but it really, if I, it really changes your day. And, you know, the other morning I woke up and I was like, you know, I just don't have time to do this whole gratitude practice and meditation. I, I gotta just, I'm just going to hit the ground running. And I'm like on my way to the bathroom and I trip and nearly fall into the toilet. And I was oh, like, gosh, <laughs> okay universe, I am going <laughs> to do my morning routine. I'm doing it. And so, you know, I, I do it and it makes such a difference. Wow. That is full of amazing things. I, I don't even know what to, what to say besides, wow, you gave some incredible insight to um, a little bit about your story. And um, the thing that I kept thinking about was that you've always taken action when you were there, you said, they had said, you have 1% chance. Well, there's a chance. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take action and do something that, that is just amazing. So Amberly, you, you go around and you're a motivational speaker, right? Yeah. Which is so crazy to me, to be honest <laughs> with you. It's like, I mean, honestly, I've lived, you know, my life on the dance floor and the, in the gym floor and you know, I, I, I wrote my book and didn't even own a computer. Technology is all new to me. <laughs> and I hand wrote my book and then bought a computer to type it up. And I mean, I know how to type. I was the fastest typer in my class. I'm very competitive. So I was like, I knew how to type, but I did not know how to work a computer. So I took, you know, a class at Apple and the instructors interrupts the class. And he's like, a uh, young lady. I said, well, thanks for calling me young. He said, I have to tell you something. I'm really impressed that you're not embarrassed to ask so many questions. And I'm like, well, I'm not because I need to learn. And I know that I need to ask a lot of questions because I have a, I, I have a mission and I need to learn this so I can do more and be of service more. And so I was just thinking of what do I need to do? How do I need to do this? And then I would take those action steps. And so then I started, after I wrote my book, I started getting asked to speak at conferences and organizations and a lot of schools and health clinics. And I remember 
the first health clinic that I was asked to speak at. And it was a crazy, like busy time. You know, we had these LA fires going on and um, I thought, well, our house will be okay. I can fly to, you know, up North and give this talk. And I get up there and, and uh, find out that we're being evacuated. So I was like a little scattered and I get to this health clinic and I'm like, well, how long would you like me to talk to all the patients? And he was like, oh, just like two hours. And I went to the bathroom and had like a moment of freak out, <laughs> like two hours. Okay. And so at that clinic was the first time I thought they, I went in, they had all the patients sitting there and they had a big whiteboard behind me and I'd never used a whiteboard for anything. And I said, I'm going to teach them what works for me. And I have something called PACER and it stands for perspective, acceptance, community, endurance, and rest. And so I grabbed the dry erase and I started writing PACER on there and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to teach this to them because it works for me. And you know what I did and I had so much fun and I had we laughed together, we cried together, we bonded. And that was like two years ago. And just today I got asked to speak again. Now it's virtually wow. at that same organization. And so I have made connections through each, you know, talk that I've given. And that to me is the best part of this journey is the connecting with others. And that's why I do it. I believe that if we can connect and we can lift each other up and we can share what works for us, then we're all better. And so, right. yeah, I, and let me tell you, I got asked to do a Ted talk and I always thought I would be so excited about that. And when I got asked, I was like, is this legit? And I emailed them. I'm like, Oh my God, this is totally legit. They want me to do a Ted talk. Like I've got 12 minutes to share the most important message of my life. How do I do this? I was scared to death. I remember I was like frozen in fear and you know, Shane, you said you take action you're right. I, that is what gets me out of that fear is if you take action, it relieves that fear. And so I, whatever I could do to get out of that fear or that anxiety or turn that anxiety into excitement, I did. And so whether that was going upstairs in my office and pacing back and forth and practicing my talk or doing some push-ups or whatever it was to take that action step to make me feel better, that's what I did. And I remember doing that TED talk. Um, they sent me a link. They're like, your media's up. And I remember scrolling through the media and the website, it scrolls up and everybody's like, PhD, PhD, PhD. Amberly Lago, PhD, PhD. <laughs> and my husband was like, um, you know, you're the only one that doesn't have anything after their name. It's just Amberly Lago. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, honey, thanks for making me feel better. <laughs> and so the curator called me and um, I said, well, you know, I'm not trying to promote my book or anything, but is there any way we could at least like add my nsca cpt initials for a trainer or the book or some little initials after my name and that was like my ego talking like yeah, totally right. into my ego you know and she said wait a minute she goes i said you know i'm the only one that doesn't have a phd and i'm talking at berkeley for the 10th anniversary <laughs> which is one of the biggest ted talks and she said listen you do have a PhD, you've got a PhD in heart. Mm -hmm. And that is why we're having you speak at our event is because you're going to touch their hearts. And I, that moment changed everything for me. So whenever I feel like I'm not enough or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not good enough to be on that stage or, cause believe me, I feel that way. You know, I, I mean, I remember when I was asked to go to Salt Lake city, and flew in and I was sharing the stage with Mel Robbins and Jay Shetty and wow. Lewis Howes and Brenda Burchard. And then there was me. 
<laughs> and nobody knew who I was. And they all had their media crew and everybody with them. And they had their agent with them. And we were backstage and around this table. And I'm sitting with all the big wigs. And this guy who I don't recognize looks over at me and he goes, who are you here with? And I'm like, oh, just me, just <laughs> me. Um, and I wish that I would have said, oh, I'm Amberly Lago. I'm yeah. the author of True Grit and Grace. But I think I was so taken back. I was like, oh, it's just me, little old me, you know? And he kind of turned his shoulder and I said, you know, he had a Texas accent. I thought, you know, Texans, we like connect. We could be friends. And I'm like, so who are you here with? And he goes, oh, I'm a boutique agent. And I said, oh, I need an agent. He goes, no, 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 I'm a boutique agent. <laughs> and he turned his back and I was like, oh my God, I felt like I had been kicked in the gut <laughs> because he was there with Jay and Lewis and Mills. He was, he was their agent and he was just like, you're not good enough. You know what I mean? And right. I was like, I had to go outside, take a breath, remind myself, like, if I can get through 34 freaking surgeries, save my leg, learn to walk again and get through chronic pain from complex regional pain syndrome every single day, I can get up on that damn stage and give a talk. And yeah. so yep. I did, I had to go out and give myself a little pep talk. And um, I got really lucky because they gave me a little time on stage and there was a big speaker that was like right before me. Cause they had me set for like inter intermission. She's going to be like right before oh, intermission, right. right before lunch. So people are going to be leaving. Well, the other speaker didn't show up. So mm. I got to go on when they were expecting for, you know, this big speaker and you know what it, I, I felt like I connected with the audience. I had people come over to me afterwards and it ended up being one of the best days of my life so the moral of that story is you know forget the naysayers listen to your heart listen to your gut follow you know believe in your purpose focus on your why and go after your dreams it doesn't matter what anybody says you can i like when people say to me oh you'll never be able to do that. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Yep. And I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to prove to myself that I can do it. You know, yeah. I use that as motivation. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Uh, because so. I think, you know, kind of what you're saying, what was bringing to my mind is you didn't attach yourself to these other, uh, these other names, right? Like you didn't attach yourself to a PhD because that's not you. That mm -hmm. doesn't define you in any way. Mm -hmm. you're Amberly Lago. That's who you are. That's, you know, you have grit, you have those things, you and, know, we've talked a, about those. And that's enough. Yeah. Amberly and that's enough. enough for you. And that, that's just amazing. Just what? Amazing. I mean, it would be nice to have a PhD. I'm not. Yeah. Gonna lie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. But yeah. Man. Yeah. But you know what? Just her telling me that her sharing that with me, just really it changed my life it and Absolutely. it gave me the confidence boost and you know i think we can all say something to someone that we never know how that might change their day you know i remember Absolutely. when i was writing my book and i i didn't know how to write a book i took a class from somebody i heard was really great and he is his name's jack grapes and i took his class and i couldn't with my work schedule and everything, I couldn't get in the beginner class. So he let me go in the advanced class. And I was in there with a bunch of, you know, published authors and poets and screenplay writers. I mean, amazing, successful yeah. <laughs> authors. And then again, there was me. And I remember having to get up in front of the class and read what the assignment was for that day. And I got up and I had written what is now the first part of my book and my hands were shaken. And afterwards I sat down and cried and he's like, why did you take my class? And I said, because I want to write a book. And it was like the first <laughs> time, like I said it out loud and he goes, well, let me tell you something. You will write a book. He said, you may have been intimidated when you first came in here by all these people, but let me tell you, they are intimidated by you now. And not that 
I wanted anybody to be intimidated sure. of me, yeah. but he was just saying that he could see how intimidated and scared and, and like, I right. did not have the confidence and it took every ounce of grit that I had to stand up in front of that class and read that. But he gave me so much when he said, you will write a book. I was like, yeah, okay. Well, Jack Grape <laughs> said, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. And so I think that if we can do that for others, it, it just helps so much. It helps. It just makes such a difference in our world. And so there's been so many people in my life that when I've struggled, just one kind word or one, you know, little shift in your perspective can change so much. Yeah, that is so awesome. Really, really great insight. So Amberly, we, we have a section in our in every podcast that Jason and I have named the double, double down, down dose. dose. <laughs> okay, let's have the double down dose. So I have a question for you and then Jason has a question for you. Okay. What how would you describe hope? Hope is to me is having that faith that that things will get better, that everything's going to be okay, that there's a chance. Hope to me is 1%. You know, it's all you need is that 1% to get you to the next level, to get you through that one day of pain to um, whatever you're struggling with is that hope carries you through. And I think that um, to me, I was given that hope by the grace of God. You know, I, I really prayed. I kind of lost my connection with my higher power, whatever you call that. You know, I, I call that my higher power, God. And when I started praying, I really got that connection back. And I feel like that gave me hope um, to believe in something bigger than me um, gave me hope. Love that. Love yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, that rings in my ears as well. And so I, I appreciate you sharing that. So, so my question for you, Amber Lee, that we kind of like to end on is what is your definition of love or how would you define love? Mm, love is the most powerful thing I think in the world. I think that love can to me, love is like the human spirit that won't give up love. When I, when I think of love and maybe this is just cause I've been watching this Spartacus on TV and, <laughs> and these warriors who like travel the country because of love, but really that's what it is. Like for me, love was, you know, my husband came to every single surgery was there every single day. He showed up for me at the hospital that was true love. He could have so easily just said, you know what, this is all too much. I'm out of here. Um, love carries you through the hardest times and it connects you and bonds you when you're going through those really challenges in your relationship or with yourself. For me, love is from within it was when I had to learn to love myself again because I hated myself and hates a four letter word in our family. Mm. And I really had to learn to love myself um, in order to get that light back inside me and really get that flame burning again. And that was hard, but I just gave, I was willing and I, I tried every bit a little bit more or every day, a little bit more and a little bit more. And I think that that it is possible to love again when you've been hurt or disappointed. And so anyway, those are the first things that come to my mind when you ask, what is love? That's a I, long answer, isn't it? I, you know <laughs> what? I love it. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Oh, what, thank what you. What really great insight. You, you know, I've really enjoyed this discussion. I'm even more excited to go back and listen to it over and over. I think you have. Oh my gosh, you are so sweet. I'm <laughs> just going to hang out with y'all all night. <laughs> <laughs> you have some incredible insight and I, I we're very thankful for your time and just the things that you've shared with us. Um, I've been touched by it. I'm 
so grateful for you and your story and your desire and willingness to one ch- one percent chance to make it better. So thank oh. you so much, Amberly. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank y'all for having me. Oh, absolutely. Amberly, we, we were so excited for this podcast recording tonight. And, and so we're, we're so happy that you came on and, and I feel touched as well. I mean, your words, you know, ring, you know, not just in my ears, but in my heart. Oh, and I'm so, I'm so you. grateful for your words and, and I appreciate you coming on and, and, uh, sharing with us and, and, uh, you know, your story and, and it's really touching. So, Oh, thank you. I appreciate um, being on the show and, and, and thank you, whoever's listening, reach out to me at amberlylago.com because that's my favorite part is just connecting with others. So yeah, reach out. Absolutely. And is there any other ways that they can get in touch with you or? Yeah. I mean, I hang out on Instagram a lot at (laughs) Amberly Lago Motivation. You can kind of see the behind the scenes and I share, you know, inspirational and motivational stuff. And right now I have a 30 day move your body challenge going on, which is a lot of fun. Um, And then, like I said, amberlylago.com and you know, sometimes when you hear a podcast, it's like, okay, I'm motivated and you kind of lose that motivation after a while or what. So I have a, um, a workbook, like I call it a playbook. Cause I like to play more. Um, but it's <laughs> really to it's goals, grit and grace playbook. And if you text the word grit to me, just text me at 818-213-7378, text the word grit And you can download your playbook and really write down your goals and, and have some tips and tools to help you reach those goals. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And just, just before we let you go, I do know that you were a dancer, right? For MC hammer at one point. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Forgot to mention that that was my first music video. That was like, Oh my gosh, I've, I've made it. I'm standing here with MC hammer in the pants and I'm doing his music video. And then we got paid a little bit extra because they decided to do a Pepsi commercial at the same time. I never saw myself in that, but um, yeah, that was like my first video. There's a lot of people that may not even remember who he is, but back in the day he was. uh, Oh yeah. Was great. (laughs) Well, thank you again so much. Best wishes to you and your family. And I hope to talk to y'all or see y'all soon in person. I hope to be there soon. Yes.